Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the virtual launch for uh, Tiao Lim Goes Western Journeys. My name is Hannah New, and I'm the marketing manager for the University of Utah Press. Um, I would first like to recognize uh, the director of the press, Glenda Cotter, in the audience. And this book that recently came out, we are very happy to publish it, very happy to have it. And at the time the book came in, the manuscript came in, she, um, Tiao was working with uh, Janelin Guo, who at the time was our creative nonfiction acquisitions editor and business manager. And I've asked Janelin to join us today, and she very graciously uh, agreed. During the event, if you have any questions, uh, we'll save them for the end. Feel free to put them in the chat, or you can uh, message them to me privately. Um, let me introduce Janelin. It's one of Janelin's books. Uh, Janelin Guo is a writer based in Philadelphia. Her first collection of short stories, Our Colony Beyond the City of Ruins, was published in 2018 with Sabido Press. And her more recent stories are forthcoming or available in a variety of literary magazines online or in print, including Diagram, Honey Lit, and Hennepin Review. She received her MFA from Brown University and her writing has been supported by McDowell and the National Endowments for the Arts. She was formerly the creative nonfiction acquisitions editor at the University of Utah Press and now runs Vested Gator, a consulting practice that supports arts organizations. Take it away, Janelyn. Thanks, Hannah. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me, for bringing me back. It's sort of nice to have seen this manuscript go full circle and is now like a book in the world, so that's awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do a quick introduction of Tiao and take it, you know, give it over to her. So um, yeah, when I was acquisitions editor in creative nonfiction at the University of Utah Press, um, I was determined to find manuscripts that I hoped would bring a new perspective on the American West, um, narratives from people experiencing the West from the margin, so to speak, um, hoping that they could elucidate the sense of palimpsest that I was feeling living out there in the West. You know, this idea of like histories written over histories and these markers, these ruins that are sort of out there in the West that, you know, are just asking to be explored or asking to be um, uncovered. And, you know, it was maybe a stroke of luck to me that um, I came across Tiao Limgo's work and it was exactly what I was searching for. Um, I feel very lucky to have gotten a chance to work on it with her. And I'm really excited for everyone here to get a taste of it. And so um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Tiao and, um, and have her take it away. So Tiao Limgo is a poet, essayist and critic. She is the author of two previous books, Islanders and Faraway Places. Her essays, poetry, and criticism have appeared in the Georgia Review, Beloit Poetry Journal, Los Angeles Review of Books, PBS NewsHour, and The New Yorker. Her collection of essays, Western Journeys, is the culmination of 15 years of writing and uncovering lost histories about places in the American West. Oh, thank, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Janelyn. Thanks, Hannah. And I uh, also would like to thank um, everybody for being here today. And also to thank the University of Utah Press for making such a beautiful book. And I am... So I think the way we're going to do this is I'm going to read for you know, about 30 minutes or so, and then uh, Jandalyn, Jandalyn and I will have the Q&A. So, um, so Western Journeys is the combination of 15 years of adventures in the American West. And I came to Denver right out of college in 2006. I was not a writer then, I was a math major, but I started writing as a way to grapple with the world around me. At first, I made observations of nature. These were simple, direct observations. I was trying to cultivate ways of seeing and making meaning. And I read plenty of histories and other accounts of the places I visited, such as Long's Peak, Monument Valley, or the Walden Ponds in Boulder, Colorado, 
And I started writing essays to make sense of these stories. So I'm going to read an excerpt from my essay, Ascent. All that morning, fog rolled from the mountains to the plains. As I hiked the trail towards Long's Peak, the firs and spruces shrunk from forest to twisted stumps. Near Timberline, close to a Russian creek, a sign warned of the dangers of lightning in the alpine tundra. For a moment, I worried that the gray mists were instead storm clouds, that I would have to turn back without reaching my destination. But as I climbed above the trees, the fog lay at my feet and spit into the sky. Before me, the three summits of Mount Meeker, Long's Peak, and Mount Lady Washington sat like monarchs, the sky a blistering blue, the fog around them a moat. At 14,259 feet, Long's Peak is not the highest point in Colorado. That would be Mount Albert at 14,440 feet. Long's Peak is a 14er, a summit above 14,000 feet, and the one most visible from Denver. Around here, bagging 14ers is a sport. There are a number of ways to reach its summit. The keyhole, the standard hiking route, is a 16 mile round trip with nearly a mile of elevation gain. In the summer, the last mile or two is mostly a scramble, but in the spring, it becomes a technical mountaineering route and climbers prefer to ascend the, prefer to ascend the couloirs on the east face with the ice axes and crampons. The most challenging route is the diamond on the east face, a thousand feet of sure vertical granite above the sparkling waters of Chasm Lake. In many cultures, the sky is a symbol of heaven. Mountains occupy the liminal space between earth and sky and are thus seen as paths to the divine. In the ninth century, Chinese poet Han Shan sought enlightenment on cold mountain. A millennia later in America, John Muir wandered in the Sierra, saw the Yosemite peaks as cathedrals and fell on his knees in prayer. A century later, another John, one who took the name of his favorite city as a stage name, sang. But the Colorado Rocky Mountain High, I've seen it raining fire in the sky. Talk to God and listen to the casual reply. On the other hand, in some parts of the Himalayas, it is considered a sacrilege to climb sacred peaks. Pilgrims circumambulate them instead, a practice of walking prayer that poet Gary Snyder brought to Mount Tamalpais just north of San Francisco. In Western culture, mountaineering is both a spiritual discipline as well as a mark of ambition and achievement. We associate heights of power. To reach a summit is to reach a pinnacle of power. There is nowhere higher to go not immediately at least. First ascents, especially of the highest peaks, make history. Think of Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay on Everest, Edward Wimper on the Matterhorn. Before a first ascent, a peak is unknown to us. To climb it successfully is also to bring back knowledge of its routes and secrets, to make the unknown known. We repeat climbers' tales of impassable walls, intractable footholds, adverse weather, harrowing descents, near slips, and fatal mistakes until they become the stories by which we define the peak. Were not the divinely illuminated passes of Albert Bierstadt Sierra meant to confirm the successful completion of our manifest destiny, writes Joan Didion of the 19th century painters romanticized depictions of the Rockies and the Sierra. We use the word virgin to describe territory that is yet to be discovered by man. 
I say man, for the concept is gendered. Places like women are prized for their purity and their value is diminished once a man has made incursions into them. To be the first then is also to claim this power for yourself. And to call yourself the first is to write a version of this history that erases those who came before you. Needless to say, the majority of explorers and climbers, at least those whose adventures we record and remember, have been white men. So I'll give you a clue how it ends. I did not climb the peak. It wasn't a part of my plan that day. I went to Chasm Lake, which is the destination in its own right. I cannot remember exactly how I first learned about the Chinese Exclusion Act, but it was in these adventures, reading up on the stories of a place that I wanted to explore. I followed a trail of web searchers and bibliographic citations to the Angel Island Immigration Station in the San Francisco Bay, where between 1910 and 1940, Chinese immigrants were detained under the exclusion laws of the time. So my first book, Islanders, writes into this history of Angel Island. But before I went down the rabbit hole of poetry, I was trying to write about it in essays. And now I will read the opening to my essay, Coastlines. In the first half of the 20th century, a Chinese immigrant carved this poem onto a wall at the Angel Island Immigration Station in the San Francisco Bay. It wasn't signed, one of many in the barracks where Chinese immigrants were detained under the exclusion laws of the time. The ocean circles a lone peak, rough terrain surrounds this prison. There are few birds flying over the cold hills. The wild goose messenger cannot find its way. From 1910 to 1940, Angel Island served as the main port of entry on the West Coast, as Ellis Island did in the New York Harbor. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act prohibited people of Chinese descent from entering the United States unless they belonged to one of the exempt classes, merchants, students, teachers, government officials, temporary visitors, U.S. citizens and their immediate families. The law was intended to keep out unskilled laborers who were seen as degenerates who took away American jobs. But in practice, the onus was on anyone who looked Chinese to prove their eligibility to land. When boats arrived in San Francisco, most of the Chinese, especially those who claimed to have immediate family in America, were ferried to Angel Island. There, they lived in barracks as they waited for their petitions to be adjudicated. On Angel Island, inspectors questioned these prospective immigrants and their families about the minutiae of, of private life, from family trees and village layouts to daily meals and the material of the living room floor. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake destroyed City Hall and many birth and death records held there. In the absence of these documents, officials resorted to testing the knowledge of a shared familial life. If the versions matched, the relationship was deemed valid and a newcomer could laugh. Discrepancies meant the deportation or a long wait on Angel Island for an appeal hearing. Most Chinese stayed on the island for two or three weeks if their cases were straightforward, but some were detained for months and even years as they waited for their appeals. In this limbo, some detainees wrote poems on the barrack walls. Many scribbled on the walls in ink but some of them also carved the words into the wood. 
They treated the horizontal wooden panels like lines in the notebook, modeling their verses after classical Chinese poetry, writing vertically from right to left. Where one poem ends, the next begins. Most of these poems are unsigned, likely to avoid retribution from the guards, but some of the poets inscribe their surnames and hometowns. Most of the detainees were young men who had borrowed money or depleted their family savings for their journeys to America, hoping to strike it rich, send money home, and eventually reunite with their kin. Failing their interrogations meant failing their families, and some killed themselves instead of returning to China in shame. They wrote about homesickness, broken dreams, anxious futures, and fears of disappointing the family. In these poems, the cold fog of the San Francisco Bay heightened the isolation of this prison. Some vowed to exact revenge on the barbaric Americans. Some affirmed a determination to succeed in spite of the obstacles in their way. Some compared their plight to Napoleon's exile on San Helena. The Angel Island coast ruffles into headlands and coves like skirts. It was a national border. And like most borders, it remained porous. As the 1906 earthquake destroyed many records, Chinese men living in the United States could claim unrelated persons as family. A system of paper sons emerged in the Chinese community. For a fee, a man would sponsor unrelated men as his sons. Brokers drew up coaching papers small booklets of fictitious family histories to tell the immigration offices at Angel Island. The paper sons memorized these details during the voyage and tossed the papers into the sea before they arrived in the San Francisco Bay. The officers knew the rules. One of them remarked that if all these stories, all these stories were true, then each Chinese woman living in America before 1900 would have had 500 children. But they had to prove familiar ties without reliable documents, matching recollections of the trivialities of family life instead, the facts they thought they could prove instead of the fluid terrains of blood and emotions. Ironically, the paper sons who had to invent their families learned the stories well and were more likely to pass the interrogations. The real sons, more secure in their sense of family, sometimes faulted, especially if the rice bin had been moved after the father left home. How do we regard truth and credibility in the face of a broken and unjust system? Now I will read a poem from Islanders. We do not have records of the poems the woman wrote as the barracks burned down in a fire. So I imagine what the woman might have said. The waves. His father died suddenly, leaving a sick wife and four young girls. He decided to go to America stake a claim on Golden Mountain and come back for me. He wrote to me of Angel Island where officers scrutinized his papers and doctors made him stand naked as they inspected his eyes. He built a business selling groceries, sent money home and came back to marry me. I threw up on the sea. He calmed me, made love to me. The first time I cried silently, I had not been with another man, but I knew he had a woman. What could I do? There was no land in sight. San Francisco, the green hills of late spring on the verge of a golden splendor, 
The city rose from the sea, veiled in the hazy blue. They let him land from the ship, but I had to board the ferry. They didn't even let us say goodbye. There's nothing we can do. Foreign wife of a Chinese merchant, your case is automatically denied. At night, I watch the sea. I want its embrace cold, dangerous, overwhelming. In these waves, I will finally be home. So I was on a different kind of adventure, roaming the land to excavate the histories of Chinese immigrants and the Old West. In one trail I followed, I traced the origins of the Chinese Exclusion Act to the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad and thus to the gold rush and manifest destiny. One of my projects is on the Chinese massacre in Rock Springs, Wyoming in 1885. It was one of the worst episodes of anti-Chinese violence in US history. Uh, the short version of the story is the Union Pacific who owned the coal mines brought in Chinese workers to break a strike in 1875. The racial tension simmered for 10 years before it boiled over into mass murder. I'm going to read a passage from my essay, The Ghosts of Bitter Creek, where I draw the connections between cowboys, railroads, and the historical roots of anti-Asian hate. The most prominent story that I found in Rock Springs, as prominent as goes in southwestern Wyoming, is that Butch Cassidy once lived here and even did time in the town jail. Cassidy was a bank and train robber and leader of an outlaw gang in the Old West, whose exploits are immortalized in Paul Newman and Robert Redford's 1969 film, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It is also rumored that Calamity Jane had a dugout in Rock Springs. She was a hot drinking, sharp shooting, trousers wearing frontiers woman who told tales of her exploits in the Indian campaigns and dalliances with other outlaws, though not Cassidy, that were as tall as the myths that shrouded her life. Like Cassidy, her story has been recounted in several Hollywood Westerns romanticized and likely fictionalized to fit a role, that of the cowboy or cowgirl who lives on the fringe of society and defies social mores in favor of a higher sense of honor. The cowboy remains a potent icon in American culture and especially in conservative politics. Three of the last four Republican presidents and presidential candidates were framed as tough going, straight talking outsiders, even though a cursory look at their backgrounds reveal lives fully embedded in the corridors of power. Donald Trump, the anti-establishment billionaire, John McCain, the flyboy maverick, and George W. Bush. Well, he literally dressed up as a cowboy, complete with a Texas ranch. Mitt Romney suits, are too well cut for him to even try to play cowboy. The fact that all these men are scions of powerful families matters less to their base than the emotional appeal of their gestures, the ideals of freedom and individualism they sought to embody. Hollywood situates the cowboy as the origin story of the American West, an emblem of stoic masculinity of power derived from the ability to control one's emotions and environment. In actuality, the cowboy myth had been formed in reaction to the closing of the frontier. The frontier represented the opportunity to start over again, creating a new self that is free from social impositions, at least for the white men and women who saw themselves as pioneers and settlers. The 1890 census showed few tracts of unpopulated land left in the West, few places left 
to serve as an escape valve, which sparked anxieties about what it meant to be American, about the direction the nation was taking. The cowboy held onto this promise of freedom. More than that, he was also a mask for the real forces that shaped the West, the corporations and industrial robber barons, and in particular, the railroads. Gold might have brought seekers from around the world to the heights of the Sierra and the Rockies, but it was the railroad that made travel across the mountains and deserts much more possible and practicable, connecting the frontier to the power centers of the East. And the railroads were the first modern corporations. The Southern Pacific, successor to the Central Pacific, was known as the octopus for its tentacles in many industries, controlling freight rates, commerce, and even settlement patterns. The more I delve into these histories, the more I see that the transcontinental railroad is the real origin story of the American West. Its force and ingenuity, the ultimate realization of manifest destiny. The charismatic and down-home cowboy is a cloak for, these, for this ideology of dominance, this white supremacy. The Chinese were among the first people who were compelled to immigrate at the beginning of the industrial era, leaving impoverished towns and ruined crop to provide backbreaking labor in a foreign land, a prefiguration to today's global displacement. For the most part, they were not slaves, not in North America at least. Instead, they inhabited a liminal space with the illusion of choice, free to accept or break contracts their lives still constrained by the circumstances of their race and origins. They were the antithesis of the cowboy, stereotyped as meek and subservient, unable to reinvent themselves, a visible representation of the underbelly of industrial capitalism that the nation would rather not acknowledge. Chinese exclusion may have been driven by tribalism and xenophobia, but it was also a backlash to the degradations of a newly mechanized world. So th there are many other threads in this book about art, the environment, women's stories. But I also expand my lens from Chinese exclusion to consider the deeper beliefs behind anti-immigration rhetoric. And now I'm going to read from my essay, Homelands. What does it mean for an immigrant to be at home? Home, we are taught, is about our origins. It is where we are born and raised. It is a sense of belonging that may be true for many people, but it has also been weaponized against immigrants. For if home is where you were born, then to migrate is to never be at home, to never have stakes. And if you have never set down meaningful roots, then it becomes easy to justify removing you. Go home, we yell at people we think do not belong, who don't look like us, even if this is where they have lived for decades, even if they were born here. Immigration is always about race. You can't tell a person's legal status just by looking at them, but you can tell if they belong to a targeted race. Between 1882 and 1943, when the Chinese Exclusion Act was in place, all Chinese people, including US citizens, had to carry papers to prove that they were legally in the country. Similarly, all Chinese people at the ports of entry had to make sure they had the right documents to land, including affidavits from white associates, even if they were US citizens. The color of their skin was enough to question the validity of their papers. 
their claims to America as home. In 1895, immigration officers at the port of San Francisco denied entry to Wong Kim Ark, a man born in the United States to Chinese immigrant parents. Under the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment, by virtue of his birth on US soil, he was automatically conferred birthright citizenship. But under the Chinese Exclusion Act, all Chinese people were considered ineligible for naturalization. The immigration officers argued that Wong, as a child of Chinese immigrants, was a Chinese subject, even though he was born in the United States. They held him on steamships off the coast of San Francisco for five months, as his lawyers argued his case before the courts. His case eventually reached the US Supreme Court in 19, 1898 as United States versus Wong Kim Ark, which ruled in his favor. But his ancestry was enough to question whether he had the right to return to his home. This ugly primacy of ancestry over citizenship reared his head again in World War II when President Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order that allowed the military to designate exclusion zones in the name of national security. On paper, the order did not specifically mention Japanese Americans, but in effect, all people of Japanese descent, including US citizens, who, due to the exclusion laws of the time, were largely US born children of Japanese immigrants were subject to forcible removal from their homes and sent to internment camps. The justification to include US citizens was the belief that they would be more loyal to Japan than America, that blood would trump the lived and made existence. In other words, not only can an immigrant never be at home, but neither could their US born and bred descendants. Immigration is one of the few criminal offenses, together with felonies such as murder and rape, that does not have a statute of limitations. That is to say, once you cross the border without proper documents, it does not matter what you do with the rest of your life. You can build a life here, work an honest job, pay so social security and Medicare taxes, raise a family and commit no heinous crimes. All that does not matter. The life for which you have worked hard and the people you love, the children who depend on you for food and shelter do not matter. There are a few ways out. Most notably, a child born in the United States can sponsor you the moment they turn 21, but that would still require two decades of hiding in the shadows and anti-immigration extremists have been arguing that despite Wong Kim Ark, the US born children of undocumented immigrants should not be granted birthright citizenship as their parents' presence in the country is a crime. If you get caught, you can be deported. Re-entry will be considered a felony and you have to wait 10 years to apply for any legal status for which you may qualify. This is not your home. Or say that your parents brought you across the border when you were five, a decision in which you had no say. You go to school here, you make friends here. You may have younger siblings who were born here and thus are US citizens. You may not remember much of the place where you were born. You may not speak the language well, you may not know anyone there, especially if your extended family has also left. What options for work and college do you have when you graduate high school? What dreams are you permitted to have? The Obama era Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program might, ha might have given you some reprieve, a work permit and temporary authorization to stay in the United States but there is no guarantee that the program will be renewed. 
already the Trump administration has tried to rescind it. But for now, the courts have blocked him. There is still no path to citizenship. Your life is dependent on the winds of politics rather than on your own skill and will. If the winds blow in the wrong direction, you can get sent back to a country you hardly even know. This is not your home. There are two kinds of power, the kind you inherit and the kind you earn. Monarchy is the ultimate inherited power. Your position in society is based entirely on the circumstances of your birth, right down to the birth order in your family. And to state the obvious, the white anti-immigrant zealots who call the United States home are descendants of immigrants if you trace their family trees far back enough, like they did for the Chinese during the Chinese exclusion era and for the Japanese during World War II. But by virtue of their cultural and political dominance, they get to call this land home. The rest of us are immigrants. For the most part, citizenship is an inherited power. Where you were born and to whom you were born determine which nations will automatically grant you citizenship. If your power and privilege are rooted in the idea of an exclusive homeland, you will want to secure the borders of that land. It is your home after all, a sentimental place where you can feel safe and protected where you can nurture your children. A person who crosses this border becomes a threat, a threat to your sense of identity and belonging and thus safety. This is why the portrayal of Mexican immigrants as gangsters and rapists took hold so easily. This is why pundits on the family values right did not flinch when the Trump administration instituted family separation policies that put children in cages without the parents, sleeping on floors and without blankets, disallowed to have toys, toothpaste, or even hugs from social workers. In fact, some of them argued these parents had relinquished their parental rights when they put their children through the dangers of the border. When we make immigration difficult, we are telling people that their blood and ancestry are more important than their abilities. We are telling people that no matter how hard they work, they can never earn the safety and protection of home. So any book project but especially one as wide ranging as Western journeys will have its outtakes. The unsuccessful drafts, the passages that gleam on their own but did not fit into a larger work. I kept a draw of them and over the years, I started making poems from the images and phrases that I found in these outtakes. It was like making found poems from my own drafts. And I made a chat book of these, these poems, Faraway Places, which came out last year from Diode Editions. These poems are imagistic and elliptical, but when I put them together, I found that they created a shadow text to Western journeys. I will finish by reading one of them. Borders. The sea is the edge of land and the beginning of another world. I live inland. When I go to the sea, I want to disappear into the blue, live with the whales and seals. I hold my breath as waves crash around me, slip in my hands. In the water, I dream of rocks. They cut my fingers and I bleed. The surge will return, but the water will hold me. I learn to swim. 
Thank you. Yay, that was awesome. Round of applause for Tiago. <laughs> Thank you. All right, yeah, so I came up with a few questions for you. Um, I know we're a little bit um, pressed for time, but I'm just going to see where this leads and, and you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so that was an awesome reading. I liked how you took um, pieces out of the larger collection to sort of showcase the kinds of writing that you were doing. And so kind of came up with some questions that sort of touched on um, the pieces that you read. And one of my questions is that there, you know, a, a very popular genre in the West is nature and environmental writing, you know, for obvious reasons. And, you know, it seems like you use these Western landscapes as entry points to the ideas at the center of your essays. And I just really love the visual details. Um, for instance, the changing coastline in coastlines, um, the first one that you read, which speaks to the arbitrariness of borders. And it, and it also strikes me that your essays are often counterbalancing the dominant narratives about the West. For instance, your essay, Ascent, which sort of challenges the peak fagging memoir for a more circumnavigatory memoir. <laughs> And you know, you cite Edward Abbey, Craig Childs, we're familiar with those people, and Rebecca Solnit. And so could you tell me about how you came to this form of writing and how you feel your work has been influenced by other authors writing about the West? Oh, thanks for the question. I, I love this question. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, like I said at the beginning, I started writing by making observations of nature and landscape. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. But but I read plenty of nature writing for examples and inspirations. Uh, what I found is we have inherited a paradigm of nature as a realm of purity, kind of an antidote, uh, antidote to the strains of modern life. Right. But implicit in this framework is the idea of nature that's apart from human without history or memory, which if you just look around you, you, you can see otherwise. And this is especially true in the West, with, you know, with our national parks and remote places and, you know, all these beautiful places. And so I was, I found that I was drawn to writing that connected the natural and human worlds. And I was also interested in subverting dominant narratives, which I could, I had the sense that they did not tell the whole story that yeah. they glossed over or outright erased what was inconvenient or uncomfortable. And so it all came together when I figured out that I could write the invisible stories of these landscapes. And I like this quote by Elizabeth Rush, who wrote a really great book on the impact of sea level rise on coastal communities. And she says, that when my nonfiction students jump into a new writing project, I ask they immerse themselves in the tradition they wish to be a part of and try to note what is missing, whose voices and perspectives have been left out. And that's essentially what I did. I had to understand what other authors have been writing about the West before I can make my contribution to the conversation. Yeah. I know that you've mentioned um, Angel Island as um, one of that, your early, I guess, yeah, like entries into mm -hmm. that kind of writing. So is that yeah. something that was like on the earlier side of how you were starting to do this kind of work? Um, so I, let's see, I started, I would say the earliest essays were probably from 2008, 2009. And I first went to Angel, Angel Island in 2010. So, so like Ascent was some, one of the earlier pieces um, and a lot of it was trying to figure out what has been said about the West, which is the easiest stories for me to reach were the stories that white people were telling themselves because this, you know, it's the dominant story and I had to figure that out before I could figure out what other stories there were. But Angel Island did come pretty 
it still did come pretty early. So yeah, yeah that was part of it. Cool. Yeah. So this actually kind of leads the segues into my other question that I had for you, which is that, you know, I like when I was looking at your manuscript, I was captivated by how you were exploring absence directly in your writing and, you know, what was missing from the dominant narrative about the West. And I was curious about how you chose what kinds of absences to explore and write about, how you, you know, decided on certain places or or themes? So, like I said, you know, my explorations of the landscape led me to the histories of the West. And the first stories I found were of white Americans trying to grapple with these wild and open spaces like planning peaks, building railroads, etc. And I guess I want to prefer to say first that, so I grew up in Singapore where the Chinese are the dominant group. And I was raised to identify with power and privilege, but I found it to be inadequate, kind of, a, it was not, it was an inadequate foundation to, you know, to be in the world, to have a rewarding life. And I knew that there was a lot more about the world that I couldn't see, which is, you know, an absence. And so I was reading authors such as, you know, Leslie Marmon Silko, Patricia Nelson Limerick, and I was learning about you know, the multiplicity of cultures, histories, and experiences in the West. And these books showed me how I might be able to grapple with the absences, the gaps in the dominant story. But then I still needed a subject to write about, <laughs> which, as we just discussed, was which I found in Angel Island and writing about Chinese exclusion. So it's, I, I, I call this my trial and error book. I had no yeah. idea what I was doing. And I was kind of like throwing things to see what, what, what stuck. Yeah, well, wonderful results from that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, so my next question is just about like being a writer and growing into your writing. You know, this was 15 years of trial and error, as you said, and, you know, seeing what works. And so along with all of these other topics you're exploring, you're also, you know, writing about your growth and resolve as a writer. And, you know, in some, in, I think in um, At the Pond, you write specifically about honing your powers of observation and being witness and, you know, really just looking and trying to write what you see. And, you know, I see that in your work, how the landscapes are so carefully rendered, like their main characters where the reader is seeing what you see. And then there are also these moments where you choose to insert yourself into these essays and write from a personal place and the reader sees you. And I'm just wondering as a creative nonfiction writer, when you include I in your work, like when, you know, how you kind of came into the style. Mm -hmm. Reading a lot of Joan Didion. Yeah, the, sh the short answer, <laughs> but okay. The, so I I knew early on that I wanted to grapple with outward topics, but from my subject position, I wanted to bring the reader along with my adventures. But at the same time, I didn't want to write a memoir in the traditional sense of rendering a private life story, and I drew on personal experiences only if they added to the discussion at hand and. The example I like to give is immigration. My immigration yeah. journey was privileged, but it did give me a perspective on the fractures of the system that someone who had never been through it might not you know, fully understand. And yeah. now I will say that early on when I showed some of these pieces to people, I got a lot of comments that I should tell my story, even in, even in pieces that were you know, more journalistic. And I have plenty of thoughts about this, you know, about what young women and people of color expected to write. And I have nothing against personal writing and, you know, self-revelation, but I will do it on my own terms. And it's not really the goal of this particular book. But all of us experience the world from a subjective lens. It could be race, it could be gender, it could be class, it could be disability. Or it could just be, you know, the particulars of our lives. Yeah. And 
the example that I give is that someone who grew up in the mountains would experience the ocean differently than someone who grew up on an island. It doesn't mean that one is more valid than the other, but they will create different meanings from the same thing. And so when we use personal experience to frame a larger subject, the reader can see where we are coming from. And it becomes a way, it can be a way to humanize the discussion. You know, like, in, you know, a lot of political discussions, if it feels very abstract rather than based on the actual lives. And so when you use your experience to frame it, you know, people can see like, oh, this is how it, how it might impact, you know, real people and we're not just, you know, on the debate yeah. floor, you know, for yeah, example. Yeah. But if we are not thoughtful about it, you know, we can end up making everything about ourselves, which is not a good look either. So it is, it is a balancing act when, when to include EI and when, when I, try, you know, chose to pull back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I noticed that in reading your collection again, um, just how it sort of changed from when I first saw it, there was, you know, more inclusion of the eye in places and, you know, like, uh, I'm not going to do this in other places. And I, I was very thrilled with how you were making those decisions. Um, so I think that maybe we can um, move this to questions from the audience, if that sounds good to you, Tiao. Um, if anyone sure. here has questions for Tiao. Just in the, for the sake of time. <laughs> I did get a message from Paul, but um, I uh, let me just read it to you. Um, uh, convert um, Jeffrey Myers' converging stories, mm -hmm. uh, race, ecology, and environmental justice. Uh, oh, you guys see it. Uh, environmental yeah. literature, or nature writing, the nonfiction, rural or wilderness based essays as the genre has traditionally been conceived has been almost the exclusive providence of white writers speaking largely to elite white concerns about the preservation of wilderness lands and excluding the interest of Native Americans, African Americans and Mexican Americans whose imaginative relationship to those lands often differs. Yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, 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 I've been semi joking that I want to create an anthology of like, you know, voices of the West. That, that's a pipe dream at this point. You can do it. <laughs> because um, there's, there's so. I mean, because first of all, since you brought this up, you know, like. I, I, I do find you don't have to be of a particular race or culture to write about the history of a particular people. But if you have personal experience of the culture, you are from it, you know what the unspoken codes are, you know what you know, these subterranean emotions are, you do have a deeper and richer perspective. So if I want to convey the, the multiplicity of stories of the West, I need to bring in other voices. I can't just do it all myself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have one more question if, uh, if there's sure. no questions from the audience. <laughs> yes, please. Um, yes, well, you know, with the piece Homelands that you just read mm -hmm. about the, you know, the Trump era and that whole thing. Um, and also some of these other pieces in your collection, like Fire Season, which was about, you know, the terrible wildfires that were happening mm -hmm. in the West during the pandemic. You know, you kind of do, that's sort of where the essay collection kind of brings us into the present moment and, you know, feels very shaky and precarious. And I'm curious about what you are thinking and writing about now and, you know, where you feel you're gonna go from here, like with this, with your writing. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the question, another good one. Yeah. Um, so I have been working on a couple of poetry projects, um, you know, on Chinese immigration in the American West. 
And one is on the Chinese massacre in Rock Springs, Wyoming that I talked about. Um, it's, uh, it's in submissions hell, so to speak. Um, but <laughs> portions of it have been published, um, things like that. Uh, the other one is a retelling of the myth of the Chinese prostitute, which is, and I based it on the story of a real woman who lived in Evanston, which is a town a hundred miles west of Rock Springs. And she helped many of the Chinese men who fled Rock Springs on a horrific day. I actually was researching the Rock Springs massacre, went to Evanston, you know, since I, I knew the Chinese men, a lot of them ended up in Rock Springs, went to the Chinese Joss House Museum and the museum docent actually point, like, pointed out, like, you know, there is this woman, there was her picture there. And not, there's not that much information. So I'm still working through this, just to cut a long story short. But more recently, I've been thinking about the larger Chinese diaspora. And the, you know, we Chinese, we have a intact and powerful motherland that stands in contrast to the war, poverty and desperation that compelled many of our ancestors to leave. And there is a sense of leaving as betrayal and disloyalty, even when conditions make it impossible to stay. So some of the questions I have is like, how do we negotiate home in the diaspora? And I do have notes, but it will be a while before something takes shape. Awesome. Yeah, yeah that's exciting news. We have a note from Kelly in the chat that says, it feels to me that the self is deeply explored in this manner of writing you describe. Let's focus on the personal I, but not excluding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's one, I mean, Ke Kelly is a friend of mine. She's pretty much my neighbor, uh, but, <laughs> uh, and I know she's writing a very deeply personal memoir. So we've had this conversations and, but I think, you know, both, both modes are, different ways of exploring the eye, you know, of that, you know, of delving into experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I'd, I'd really like to, we're just coming at the end of the hour and I just really like to thank Janelin and Tiao for joining us today for this conversation and, and for all of you for participating and, and joining and listening and um, give me a couple of weeks and I'll have this um, up on YouTube and oh, I'll cool. be sure to send you all a, a link to it. But thank oh, you very okay. much. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations on your book launch. Everybody should get a copy. Yeah. <laughs> I put a link to the book okay. in the chat if anybody, but you can also just search Western Journeys. You should find it on everything. But support your local bookstore. Mm -hmm. Well, that, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for being being in conversation with me. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank thank you. <laughs>